are Locked On Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked On Bucks podcast, David Harrison here, joined now by Tampa Bay Buccaneers assistant defensive line coach, Lori Locus on Twitter at Coach Low Loke. If you haven't followed her already, you need to. Definitely one of the more interesting follows in the National Football League, especially from the Buccaneers uh, coaching staff. No offense to any other Buccaneers coaches, but probably the best coaching uh, Twitter follow you can have. If you're a Buccaneers fan, Coach, first of all, thank you for for joining us. And, and we're here, obviously, on behalf of USAA. And you got to spend the day uh, with some with Washington football team's assistant running back, Coach Jennifer King, first of all, and two woman women veterans. Uh, thanks to uh, USAA being the sponsor for the Salute to Service Week uh, for the NFL. In the video produced from that day, uh, you all shared some examples of some of the similarities uh, being in the NFL and, and being in the military. Is there something specifically that you feel embodies what it takes to thrive in both of the environments, especially women in those traditionally male-dominated spaces? Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible experience. And like you said, uh, Jennifer King and I are good friends, so it was nice to be able to spend some time with her. Uh, certainly this week we've been sort of uh, at each other a little bit, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, Yen, Chris, and Vanessa were amazing women, and just the ability uh, to talk with them and get to connect with them, you know, so thankful that USAA put us together that way. But you're right, I think that there's a lot of parallels to uh, to what we do, and it's it's always interesting to see that there are other women, and I'll correct you in a, in a nice way, but I always say male prevalent. I don't say male dominated because, okay, I feel yeah. as though, you know, at this point in time, there are so many women that are making strides to do what they want and do what they have a passion for that it's sort of a little bit less contentious when we come in saying uh, male prevalent. But um, yes. Uh, I think commitment to excellence uh, in what we do. I think that uh, the passion, obviously, for doing the best job possible, those women have made incredible strides and have gotten over a lot of obstacles. And, you know, I think, you know, not speaking for Jen King, but I mean, you know, over the course of my career, I mean, I'm looking at, whew, I was just trying to like add these years up, probably about like 15 or 16 years of coaching right now. You know, there's there's been a lot of times where I've, sacrificed a little bit here or there or you know really didn't sleep or really just had a singular focus and you know not to say that my sacrifice by any means or any of us uh runs the same as what anyone in the military would do certainly those sacrifices are much greater but it's just it's always enlightening to see that there are other women that are doing the same type of you know path just in a in a different sort of work environment, and that we're there's so many commonalities to it. It was it was just a very great day. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, uh, I, I told Coach King when I talked to her uh, for the for the same event, and I'll tell you, I'll share the same thing with you. In, in my deployment uh, earlier in my my first career uh, with the Army, I, I had a, a female, or we call them females in the military. No, in the civilian world, female is not traditionally the word used, but. I had women in my chain of command. My commander was a woman. My first sergeant was a woman. My platoon leader was a woman. And then the gunner on my own team, uh, my own military police team, was also a woman. And I think that it, it kind of shows what can be uh, accomplished in, in the world if we kind of uh, re remember that we're out there to do a job, right? In 2005, we never brought that up. We never had a conversation about all of these women being in our, our formation and being in leadership positions because they were just our leaders and they were our fellow soldiers and they were just doing the job. It wasn't until later in my career when I became more of a senior leader those things kind of came up and that's kind of part of my experiences in my journey, their experiences obviously in their journey. And you are no stranger to talking about your own journey and being the first woman to be hired as a full-time coach uh, in the NFL. And I know you didn't set out to be a trailblazer, right? And coach King kind of echoed the exact same sentiment, right. not being your goal, but you become one anyway. And sometimes we're putting the role we need to be in and not the role we choose. Uh, the military is really good about passing down legacies and that's something obviously the USAA is emphasized by offering services to service members and the families, the legacy members of those families, right? So if there's something from your experiences, and and, and I kind of like the the unity message, right, from that you could pass down to anybody wanting to be a coach, not just women, but also uh, young men or, or boys who maybe aspire to be in a position like you one day, what would that legacy be for them? Right. And it, man, I love that word legacy. I think about that all the time, trying to, to set a legacy for my own two sons, you know, mm -hmm. this, they're my why. 
And uh, the reason that I, you know, have gotten through some of the tougher times because I want to make sure that they see that anything is possible and that, you know, it, sometimes in life you have to pivot when you can pivot. Mine came a lot later in life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something, too, that I want them to know. But, um, you know, from a coaching standpoint, it's just and, and the military is probably the same way, but it, it's it's not for everybody. And you really have to understand that this is not something where you can snap your fingers and just be in the NFL or you can snap your fingers and, you know, be in the position that you want to be in. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of sacrifice and it takes a lot of really trying to do everything you can to get educated in whatever aspect that you want to get into as far as a coaching position or whatever. I mean, the NFL has been amazing because there have been so many positions that are sort of outside of the football realm that nobody really knows about. So you can be close to the game. But if you truly want to be like from a coaching standpoint, you have to be able to know what you're talking about. You have to be able to have the experience behind you. Um, I played semi-pro for four years, you know, obviously not, you know, going to hold up against, you know, playing since I was six years old. But um you know, I didn't have the traditional path. And I think that that's important if there are other women that want to get into coaching, that we help them establish a framework. I know Jen King has done it. I've done it. Um, we do look all the time for young women, especially that are interested and try and mentor them, you know, up through. And um, I think that that's something as well, you know, find a good mentor, find somebody that you can ask questions you know, in a non-judgmental type of environment and get good advice early and do it for the right reasons. You know, this is like you mentioned, I mean, I'm, I've never set out to be, you know, the first, not about the media, you know, trying to just do that. Like, I just want to coach <laughs> and I just yeah. want to be a good coach and I just want to contribute and be viable. And I'd like to stay employed for a good long time at this level. And you know, it's just you have to have your priorities in order, I think, too, because um, once you become non-authentic in this position, it's it's real clear and real obvious and not where you need to be. Yeah, you got to be an honest broker. Right? I think that's that's the key to being any type of a leader, but especially probably in coaching uh, and yeah. then in, in results based businesses. And I like the point that you bring up, too, about you don't have to necessarily be a coach. You don't necessarily have to be a player if you want to be close to the game. I know uh, right. Carmen Vitale, you, you obviously are very familiar with Carmen. She's very familiar with our audience, been on the show uh, a ton of times where we're happy to have her as always. Uh, I kind of think back a little bit. I'm like, I kind of wish I had your dad who pointed out that, hey, even if you can't play, because uh, I was never good at football physically, like playing football, I could talk about it, um, yeah. obviously, which is why I do it. But yeah, so to, to have that that uh, that ramp up to the NFL as well. And then sure. uh, you mentioned in coaching, you've got two veteran starters on the defensive line and a young stud in, in Vita Vea, but Will Golson uh, and Dominic and Sue. What's the dynamic working uh, with those three guys? You just you see them on the field. They seem to have fun. I know there's some fun nicknames that go around uh, within the group, especially for Indomitian. And then, uh, I mean, Indomitian's financial tweets, like uh, one, they're enlightening wow. and they're eye opening. And I, I think uh, he's doing really amazing work. So yep. if, if a retweet from a show Twitter account helps in any way, shape or form, we're happy to do it. Uh, but then you add a guy like Raheem Nunez Rochez in there and other members of the defensive line group. I mean, what is just working in that dynamic with you guys? Uh, what, what is that really like? Yeah. So first of all, to be in uh, that room, you know, Coach Rogers has done and it's in the three years that we've been here or two and a half. I mean, what an incredible job, you know, he's done because you had a group of individuals in that room, but they're not to throw shade on the people that were before us, but there really wasn't a lot of good chemistry that, you know, mm -hmm. they they really didn't. It, it wasn't. Uh, cohesive at all. And it, it was different when we first came in. And I think that he's really been able to change the culture just in our room. Um, I have not been in a better D-line room uh, than the one here that we have because everybody has grown together. Uh, the overall uh, football IQ has been raised so much by Co Coach Rogers because he challenges everyone in the room, you know, to not just know their assignment, but Will could tell you what everybody else on the whole entire D-line is doing, including the linebackers. And we'll be very detailed to come off and tell you that, you know, this wasn't done or, you know, it should have been this and not that. And, 
you know, it's just, it's so cool to see them go over that edge where now it's, they're really studying. And like you said, that we have veterans in that room, but yet they're still so coachable, right? They want to learn, they want to get better. Nobody's at a place where they're coasting and, you know, sort of just, you know, on their way out. And, um, they, they fuel one another. There's a lot of good uh, ribbing, like you said, within the room, a lot of good nicknames. And um, I think it's amazing. I follow Sue's financial uh, tweets, and I think that they've just been very insightful and helpful. And it's nice to see him in a different aspect than people sometimes might think of him. And um, I just consider him to be the ultimate professional. He has been since he's walked in the door always respectful, always willing to uh, to help out his teammates. It, it's just an incredible room. Absolutely, yeah. And I know Sue's on-field persona can kind of lend into some of those stereotypes or judgments that people pass about him. And we had to answer plenty of those questions when he first joined the Buccaneers yeah. as well. Unfortunately, he's proven what we expected out of him uh, from you know the the reputation standpoint, correct? And he hasn't, you know, he's, he's been a great addition, obviously, to the team. Uh, yeah. But some of those things run in emotions, right? Emotions can run high in any game. Uh, we saw some of those motions run high against the New Orleans Saints for for many obvious reasons. Uh, this weekend's matchup against the Washington football team kind of has the feel of a game where your entire team, really, as, as a whole from, from uh, many different levels, are looking to correct some of the mistakes that happened in Week 8. So how do you, as a leader, go about leveraging those motivations during practice? Because I imagine you want that motivation in there you know, for, for practice and then, but then also kind of pull in that emotion a little bit so it doesn't get out of hand as needed during the game. Uh, so that there aren't the repeat mistakes like what we saw a little bit in, in New Orleans uh, coming off of a game with as many penalties as there were. Yeah, and I think that that's always a point of emphasis for us. I mean, the amount of time that we spend reviewing game tape with the guys as well as, you know, as a coaching staff and, you know, trying to determine what we can do differently, how we can approach it, how we can possibly put them in a better position. You know, Coach Bowles is a magician uh, when it comes to stuff like that. And I think, you know, it's just um, it's just kind of the the way that the season rides out, right? Like there are different opponents where, you know, we have not possibly collectively played uh, the way we would like to play. But then, you know, with a few tweaks and corrections, you know, a win is a win and, and we'll take that. But I think we're always constantly evaluating and looking at ways that we want to, like you said, you know, you kind of have to, you think about it as a, a marathon, right? Not a sprint. And you're you're trying to like hold back enough energy to just really like burst through the finish line. And I think that there's always that undercurrent of just raw emotion because you don't want to overcoach a defensive line, but we also have to know how to play within, you know, the scheme of unfortunately the way that the officiating has been right now. And then also the game plan itself. So um, the guys are smart about it. And certainly, you know, there's always going to be, you know, stuff here or there that could be a mistake, but um, they're committed always to doing the best job possible on the field. And uh, it's, it is a mix. It's a mix of kind of controlled chaos and just domination. And, uh, you know, the emotion's always there, but it's just trying to find the way to channel it correctly so that we get the results needed without it getting out of hand. Absolutely. And then you mentioned getting the job done, right? Uh, we've yeah. talked about your friendship with uh, with Jennifer King, assistant running back coach for the Washington football team. And uh, again, I spoke to her earlier in the week and I asked her pretty much the same uh, type of question you're facing. Every 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 part of competition in the NFL is tough, but you're facing uh, two running backs here in Antonio Gibson, and J.D. McKissick, that also used to be wide receivers. So they obviously mm -hmm. have uh, some of the pass catching ability. Jarrett Patterson has shown uh, some flashes of talent and, and uh, proving to people why he was an undrafted free agent that made an NFL roster in his rookie season. What do you expect from your your friends running backs there in this game that watch football team offensive line that have been surprisingly a, a strength of the team, honestly, and getting a little bit healthier just in time for this matchup against your guys? Yeah, I mean, and um, <laughs> yeah, I always tell Jennifer uh, about our D-line before she tells me about her running backs. But, uh, you know, listen, so. I don't think that we can underestimate any any opponent. Um, you know, we certainly try and take every game um, like it's, you know, the biggest game possible, right? Um, the tendencies of the backs have been made pretty clear, you know, by film study. So the guys are prepared for that. Um, I think we also need to watch how, you know, this quarterback has a tendency to make plays with his feet. And we have to be respectful of that as well. And that's certainly an extension of their run game. 
Um, the use of uh, McKissick in the screen game is an extension of the run game as well. Be, you know, that's another aspect that we kind of have to um, have an impact on, although, you know, sometimes screen, obviously the D line doesn't have a hand in uh, trying to control that from the edges, but um, from an overall standpoint, you know, look, we've looked at them um, as we played them last year. We've looked at their games coming up to this point. Um, the game plan is very solid. We just have to execute it and, uh, you know, just kind of keep it moving. But yeah, I'll, uh, we'll visit pregame for a little bit. We don't talk too much football from this point until <laughs> till Sunday night probably, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're they're very effective in what they do. And even though a lot of O-lines this year, I've had a lot of injuries, um, mm -hmm. you know, look, you're in the league as a backup, you know, certainly that makes you viable enough. And like any team, it's next man up. So um, we're prepping for who we know to be healthy right now. That could change game time and we just have to be ready. Absolutely. And, and fortunately, the Buccaneers defensive line, you guys have, have been relatively healthy. I mean, I think by now everybody's a little bit banged up, right? But relatively yeah. healthy. Coach Lowe, my, my final question for you, a little bit of a fun one, hopefully to, to wrap things up here. A military theme question as we're getting ready uh, for Salute to Service Week in the NFL. Uh, if you got drafted in the military for whatever reason, you decided sure. you wanted to join the military, but you could choose whatever job uh, you had to do in the military, which job would you choose and why? So that's very uh, funny that you asked me that question because up and until I was about eight years old, I wanted to be a fighter pilot in the nice. Air Force. Yeah. So and then uh, I had all kinds of plane uh, books about planes and, and jets. I had the little models that you put together that were, were yeah. very intricate. Um, but then uh, I had to get glasses and somebody mm -hmm. told me that my eyesight would not be good enough to uh, be a fighter pilot. So. Um, I always had that in the back of my mind and um, almost went to uh, to active duty uh, for Air Force uh, out of my junior year in high school. But a lot of things changed. My dad was in the military. He was uh, okay. an airplane mechanic uh, in nice. World War II. Yeah. And so um, that could have been some of it, although I just think I like to go fast and shoot things <laughs> would have probably been the other. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's, that's where I would have loved to have ended up had I had a military career. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to be a fighter pilot for a long time, too. And then my uh, educational efforts didn't match up with my uh, career aspirations. But look, you went on to play football yourself, coaching football, Super yeah. Bowl champion of NFL coach, Coach Lori Locus on Twitter. Again, at Coach Low Loke on Twitter. If you're not already following her, guys, you definitely need to. Assistant defensive line coach for the Super Bowl champion, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Special thank you to USAA for connecting us before this weekend's contest. And thank you, Coach uh, for joining me. I, I wish you safe travels this weekend Thanks. and all throughout the season. Good luck this weekend and good luck in the rest of the year. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the time with you. Appreciate you, Coach. Thanks.